Welcome to Puto Politics, the political podcast of the San Antonio Express News. My name is Gilbert Garcia, Metro columnist, and I'm joined by City Hall reporter Joshua Fector. Investigative reporter Brian Chasnoff. And it's been a week since uh, we got together with you all. And uh, what have we learned in that time? We've learned uh, that if you're having breakfast with Patrick Von Dolan, uh, you might not want to order fresh squeezed grapefruit juice, particularly if he's picking up the tab. Just wanted to put that out there. Um, but we also learned uh, over the past week uh, a lot more about how the city voted in this recent election. And uh, Josh, you, uh, Emily Eaton, and uh, Ryan Serpico did a really excellent piece taking data from the Bear County Elections Office and kind of breaking it down and looking at, at how the city voted. What were the big takeaways for you when you when you looked at uh, at that stuff? When when I took a look at it, you know, a couple things struck me. One was, you know, Prop B, as you could probably glean from the result, was fairly divisive. Like there there were a lot of parts of town where it was very sort of neck and neck. Um, but you know, it was mainly sort of like conservative North siders, uh, that sort of drove the opposition to it. Um, uh, everything, all of the support that you could, uh, see for it, um, uh, was, you know, sort of coming from within the inner city, but obviously votes either or, or for, for or against, um, uh, were coming from all over the city, but those were where it was most concentrated. And, you know, what struck me about this was at the same time that this was going on, uh, Mayor Ron Nuremberg was basically making inroads all over the city. There's pretty much no part of uh, San Antonio where he didn't do better uh, than he did in 2019 and 2017. Um, You know, he basically took over a lot of, you know, typically sort of conservative territory on the north side, um, you know, right. a lot of territory outside of 410 that typically votes uh, Republican or conservative areas that went for Trump in November, wind up going for Nuremberg this time, places that voted against him in 2019 went for him this time. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a sign that he's of, of either – you know, one of two things, either he's really brought into support during the pandemic or he's just figured out ways to sort of turn out uh, his voters and to get sort of these, you know, sort of left leaning votes that will come out in favor of him. Yeah. Uh, and he's managed to do that all across the city. Well, I'm, I'm curious what you what everyone's take is on this, because one of the things I remember, we've talked a little bit about. Julian Castro, when he ran for his third term, and he got reelected easily. I think he got about 65 percent. But you know, the turnout was very low. And I remember that the time there was kind of this feeling like it was kind of an underwhelming result for him, given that he didn't have any strong challengers. And, um, you know, because this came right after a few months after pre-K 4SA had passed, which was a divisive issue. It was a few months after he had spoken at the Democratic National Convention, which kind of put him out there a little bit more as a partisan figure. And so you could kind of sense that the support for him, it was starting to become more uh, something along partisan lines. Whereas with Nuremberg, it seems like he's becoming this more of this bipartisan figure in, in, in San Antonio. I mean, is that the way you all, when you look at the results, is that is, is that the big takeaway? I mean, yeah, I think, uh, you know, especially after, you know, he defeated Ivy Taylor, there was a feeling that, you know, he was... He was a clear cut progressive and the city council was about to take, you know, a hard turn to the left. I think he's, you know, kind of conducted himself in a much more uh, nonpartisan way. I think, you know, conservatives might disagree with that, looking at things like, you know, the, you know, winning support for a sales tax for uh, job training. But yeah, I mean, I think he's, you know, he at least in tone, he's he's been very careful about portraying himself in kind of a nonpartisan way. And I think that has its appeal, coupled with the fact that, I mean, it's like, look, the last year has been, like, com- completely unique in the history of San Antonio. I mean, you know, we, we've we never before had a pandemic shut down the city. Uh, and, you know, he he managed that very well, and I think he got credit for it. So you, you couple, you know, his performance 
the way he handled, you know, handled himself during the pandemic and his kind of nonpartisan bents. I think that, you know, that goes a long way in explaining the election result. What do you think, Brian? Well, I, I don't think he actually had a, a, a formidable challenger. Right. I mean, I mean, I just don't think uh, Brockhouse really delivered on whatever potential he had left. Yeah. Um, that, that might be a result of, uh, I mean, I, I don't know what, what y'all's opinion is on this, but he, he might have been just too badly damaged uh, the last time around. Yeah. I think that's right. I think that in a way we, we would have a better test if we had, if he, if he'd had maybe an, an opponent who, um, was really able to sort of galvanize conservatives in a way that Brockhouse this time around at least was not really able to do. And it was really fascinating looking at that map, because as you pointed out, Josh, I mean, if you look around like the per- perimeter of the city, you know, that's really where the opposition to the prop B was, but in that same, in those same areas, you see so many precincts were uh, Nuremberg that he was able to flip from 2019. Um, one thing that I also thought was interesting is that, you know, in talking to people who were really involved with labor, and this is where Prop B got complicated because you had a lot of sort of progressive Democrats who voted against Prop B because they're, they have a history with, with organized labor. And, uh, I was told that like AFL CIO really worked hard in, in district nine, which is, you know, North side district. And they, they got what I heard was something like 37% turnout among people who were either active or retired AFL CIO. And I would think a lot of those people were against prop B. So this is, if you look at these kinds of things, I mean, that, that could have made the difference in this kind of a close election. Yeah, it, um, it shows you definitely the uh, the split that Prop B kind of created among sort of left leaning voters. I mean, you have obviously probably more con- more old school um, labor Democrats who were you know kind of skeptical about Prop B, and you know the, sort of these these sort of m- more hardline progressive types, or, or you know just more strident. Uh, sort of, you know, police reform types who, who really were like, you know what, we need to, to see some kind of reform. I mean, and, you know, district one, for example, you know, this, this passed by more than a margin of two, probably, you know, passed by more than a margin of two thirds. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think it did really create a split. Um, uh, you know, one, one other thing that, that was, was interesting to me about this is, you know, Nuremberg making inroads in, in some of these other, you know, more conservative parts of town, you know, he, he deliberately sort of went after uh, places that went for Biden on the North side and places that went Mm -hmm. for, uh, uh, went for the ready to work program in November, which we have to remember passed by, you know, 76%. And you don't get there without, you know, without some degree of, 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 uh, conservative Republican support. Um, so, I mean, they were, they were definitely going out and trying to flip a lot of, uh, broadcast territory that kind of signaled, um, that perhaps it was, it was more amenable to the mayor this time around. I was going to say, um, I also wonder how demoralizing, uh, it was for Republicans, the, the entire Trump fiasco from <laughs> November through January, February. Um, I mean, yeah. I, I, I've, I've heard, I've heard, I, I, I just don't know if that, that, that might've taken the wind out of Brock House's sales somewhat because I, I'm sure the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, election, the, the false election narrative that Trump had, had yeah. pushed and culminating in the insurrection in January, um, it might have just turned a lot of people off, you know, uh, who otherwise would have been. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. I do get the feeling, though, that you know, Trump supporters who, you know, on, on January 5th believed that Democrats had stolen the election from Trump. I think on January 7th, the day after, they still felt that way. <laughs> I mean, I don't know that I don't know that that would dissuade them from from voting in the city election. Yeah, that they that's true. I mean, there's 70, 70 percent of Republicans supposedly still believe that Biden stole the election. So 
I think what it, what it could have done is that, you know, I, it may have affected how much Brockhouse wanted to tie himself to, to Trump or, you know, the way he tried to message the, his Trump supporters. Cause I, you know, from what I saw, I mean, Brockhouse, his, his, uh, his campaign messaging this time around was, it was clearly different. Like he was, even while he opposed proposition B, he would he talk about how he wanted to get together with police, you know, reform groups and talk to them. And in, in almost every case he talked about, you know, wanting to, wanting to listen to the other side and talk. And he was not, uh, at least from what I saw, he was, he was not, um, as strident as he had been two years before. And, you know, that the strident message w- would probably help to, you know, uh, attract, you know, hardcore conservatives two years ago. Um, but I, you know, and maybe yeah, some, to me that yeah. that was always a defining attribute of Brock house, how he, right. he kind of straddled issues. Have you noticed that how yes. he would, he would rail against something and then vote for it? Yeah. Um, or, when he was on council, it was sort of a perplexing characteristic. It's absolutely. Yeah. He was like, I'll vote for it, but I'm not happy about it. Or I voted against it just because I didn't like the process by which it was, you know, it was, it was, it, he, he would, you're right. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he has had a history of that, of yeah. sort of wanting and then, to. And then Nuremberg was like, process? You want some process? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, I, yeah. That's right. The king of process. The king of process. Um, <laughs> Josh, uh, you had a really good story this past week, uh, which uh, I think was uh, an eye opener for a lot of us about the spending on the campaign, because, um, uh, you know, up until you wrote wrote about this, I think we all thought that the uh, San Antonio Police Officers Association hadn't really spent all that much on the campaign, that they had been outspent by a, a large margin. Uh, compared to fix SAPD. And it, it looks like they were kind of, uh, well, I don't know if we would say they were hiding their, their funding and their spending, but uh, you t- tell us a little bit about what you found. Well, it was certainly not easy to find um, if, if they weren't deliberately hiding it. Uh, so basically yeah. it's, it's like you said, Gilbert, like throughout this whole campaign, like everybody was sort of scratching their heads, you know, the police union, appeared to be sort of like spending very little to fend off like this. I mean, it was an existential threat to, to, to their collective bargaining rights. Um, and, you know, throughout the campaign, they only seem to be spending about five figures um, throughout yeah. the whole campaign. And, you know, people had been, uh, who were sort of union allies were like, what, what are they doing? Like, why, are, why aren't they running like a, a, you know, really robust campaign? Well, it turns out they were spending uh, quite a bit. And we should note that, you know, uh, Fix SAPD was, was, you know, raising and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, a lot of it coming from the Texas organizing project, um, you know, six figure right. donations from, uh, from top and, you know, various sort of, uh, top affiliates. And, you know, so everybody was, was wondering, well, where, where is the police union on this? Um, and it turns out that they were spending quite a bit. Um, they were spending North of $600,000. Um, but the reason nobody seemed to know about this was that they weren't filing it underneath their own name. They were not filing it under the San Antonio Police Officers Association. They weren't filing it under their PAC. Instead, they were filing it under the name of the uh, of the union's treasurer. And mm-hmm. this this was um, you know credit where credit is due. Um, you know, Fix SAPD discovered this. And, mm-hmm. you know, which is how I found out about it. Um, yeah. But, you know, I talked to, you know, people who have sort of experience dealing with the state ethics commission, people who are experts in campaign finance law. And uh, this seems mm-hmm. like, you know, a big no, no. You, if you right. spend under, if you spend money, um, you have to disclose it under your own name. Um, so there's a potential that, you know, they could face a fairly hefty ethics commission fine. Um, but that's kind mm-hmm. of contingent on whether anybody actually wants to like file a formal complaint about this. Uh, Fix SAPD has, hasn't said whether they're, they're going to go that route. Um, but yeah, so th- 
it, it gives a whole lot more. Like if you if you thought that it was it was weird that the police union didn't appear to be spending that much, and yet you saw you know a lot of block walkers from mm-hmm. them. You saw a lot of signs. You saw uh, you know them you know manning the poll sites in a in a fairly sort of hefty presence. Uh, this would go a long way towards explaining that. And we should note that. We should note real quick that you know, the 600k they spent all went to uh, this uh, um, basically this local PR shop, uh, Public Alliance. It's like a big block, big block expenditure. So you can't really see much of the, the you know, there's no real line item sort of. Yeah. Uh, do you have any any sense of why they would hide their spending like that? Why would they try to mask it? Th- what their explanation for all this was simply. Uh, uh, well, the Texas Ethics Commission didn't give us the option to file it under our name. So, like, it would only allow us to file it under our treasurer's name, which if, it, which is, yeah, if you look, you can look up anybody's spending. Like, you could look up the San Antonio Professional Firefighters Association spending um, yeah. fairly easily. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that explanation of theirs. Um, but basically, like the the if you just kind of think about this as uh, as a different kind of basically the money was coming straight out of union dues, like it wasn't coming from campaign contributions, as far as I can tell. Right. Um, it was coming out of sort of direct sort of contributions to the union from its members, um, and basically you're allowed to do sort of direct campaign expenditures. Uh, on a ballot measure and you can basically spend as much as you would like on it. Um, corporations and unions are allowed to do this, but you have to report it under your name. Otherwise, um, that's sort of flouting the law and the spirit of the law. You know, one of the things that, that, that I was thinking about, because, you know, is that in, in doing it this way, I mean, they, the one, they ha- one of the big issues for Sapoa in this election uh, that they kept driving home was this idea that Fix SAPD was getting tons of outside money, you know, as you said, from Texas Organizing Project. And they were kind of making a big deal about that. And that's often a, a big, uh, you know, a campaign message that, that uh, where one side will say, oh, this, all this outside money is coming in and this is just, this is weird. And so I think Sapoa possibly looked at this situation and thought, it was, it was going to be a much more effective argument. I'll put it this way for Sapoa to be able to make, to say that if people didn't see how much money they had in their coffers and how much they were spending, I mean, isn't, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it definitely sort of, uh, weakens their whole, their whole stance on, on yeah. this measure. I mean, they were arguing this, this whole time that, you know, fix SAPD was just getting, you know, a, bunch of a bunch of dark money which they were but you know they were also mm-hmm. hiding you know to some degree <laughs> whether they meant to or not um where yeah. where their where their spending was and you know by virtue of the fact that they're a union they do not have to disclose where that money comes from they say that it's that it's from their union dues and that it's out of their their sort of their general budget, but they don't have to disclose that to the public or the IRS. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it definitely, you know, splashes back on them to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we wrap things up, I wanted to talk with you, Greg, a little bit about a column you did this past week. Um, former mayor, former head secretary, Henry Cisneros is like the, the lead author uh, on a book Sort of looking at the, the the Texas economy and where we're going, and it's it's focused on the on the the Texas Triangle, which you know, includes Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, the San Antonio, Austin area. Um, what what were the the big points that that he and his co-authors were trying to make about the Texas Triangle? That if you take those three urban centers together. <clears throat> Their impact is huge. <laughs> I mean, really, that's that's the thrust of it. I mean, you, you know, it's got just just the yeah. Texas Triangle. Uh, you know, it's got a, a GDP, a gross domestic project, uh, product of about one point three trillion, 
annually. That's just over the last couple of years. And that makes it, you know, I think the fifth largest of the world's leading mega regions. Uh, the, the trick is, um, you know, the, the book, you know, the Cisneros' book is all about defining, you know, these three urban centers as the Texas Triangle. And, you know, he provides just a wealth of, you know, data and a lot of detail, kind of making the case that this is a huge economic engine, not just for Texas, obviously, but, but for the country. Uh, you know, it's catching up with Northern and Southern California. It's catching up with the Northeast Corridor, with South South Florida. It's actually surpassed South Florida. Um, the The problem is uh, there's no <laughs> to 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 think of a mega region as an economic engine like that. I mean, it's it's really. Uh, it takes a lot of coordination between cities. I mean, it takes transportation planning. Uh, it starts with really transportation mm-hmm. planning, but you know, you have to you have to create kind of a common political agenda. Like, what is it that these cities within the mega region need from the state legislature and from from Congress? The problem is there's none of that really going on between Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, and San Antonio, Austin. It's still pretty much every city for itself. So really, I think what what Cisneros is really trying to say in this book, I mean, he he is trying to kind of create this idea that, you know, you do have this kind of, you know, this this kind of uh, cohesive engine, and it's going to do great things economically and make... You know, Texas much more prosperous in the future and bring a lot of jobs. But really what he's saying is big cities are hugely important to the economy. Um, and we need to be more mindful of that. Like we need, you know, we need a legislature and state political leadership that isn't trying to dump all over big cities like Governor Greg Abbott and Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. I mean, it's yep. it's damaging to the work mm-hmm. of cities. Uh, to talk, you know, to try to curb annexation rights, to, you know, to say, okay, big cities and big urban counties, you can't lobby the legislature for what you need. That's a waste of taxpayer dollars. Oh, uh, and by the way, if, you know, if there's a lot of voting going on in big cities and you're voting for Democrats, hey, guess what? We're going to take some of your, your early voting <laughs> opportunities away from you. Like, all, of that, all of that is detrimental. <laughs> And it, yeah, I mean, I think that right. was part of the thrust of his book. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to say, look, I mean, these cities, you know, if it weren't for uh, the the economic production of these cities, I mean, we'd be really hurting in Texas. Like these these three centers are pulling the state. Like when Absolutely. we talk about the Texas miracle, it's happening here within the triangle. Yet, uh, you know, you couldn't tell looking at the state's political leadership. Yeah. I mean, because you've got, you've got a situation where, as he pointed out, uh, you know, more people are living now in cities and that's where the economic activity is. But the political leadership in the state, uh, the Republican leadership, their their votes are concentrated in, in rural areas. And so they are sort of hostile to cities. I mean, you have uh, Governor Abbott constantly making hay out of all the people who are moving from California and elsewhere in the country to Texas. Well, guess where they're moving to? It's mm-hmm. not, you know, it's not West Texas. Well, <laughs> I mean, yeah. They're moving. Yeah. Almost all of them are moving to these urban centers. And yet, you know, so he's he's touting that on the one hand. And he's attacking cities on the other. I mean, it's just nonsensical. It is nonsensical. And (laughs) as you pointed out, I mean, the lack of coordination to between the cities. I remember a few years ago when, you know, there was kind of a we've had these periodic uh, sort of pushes in San Antonio to try to see what we can do. Should we have a new airport? Should we work with Austin? And I, I, I think a few years back there was, there was talk about working with Austin, but it, you know, it seemed like kind of a non-starter as, as you pointed out, there's never, you know, a, a, some kind of rail system connecting the cities and the tr- Texas triangle would have been fantastic. Yeah. I was going to say, we can't even do commuter rail between San Antonio and Austin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like if you can't do a rail line covering 70 miles or, you know, like 90, if you want to go to Northern Austin, Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, you know, there's just not, you know, that that's a pretty easy one you would think. 
if if both cities were serious about making it happen, it would have happened by now. I was just going to say that that uh, as, as you pointed out in the column, I mean, it's it's the, the triangle is kind of more of a of an idea than a reality at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and it's you know even you know with the southern tip of this triangle, I mean, there's so little you know there's so little communication going on between San Antonio and Austin right now. I mean, it's kind of nuts, but you can you can understand it from Austin's standpoint. Like Austin is, you know, like really Houston is is Texas's only real global city. I mean, it's it is an energy giant. It is the most diverse city in the country, and it's got some amazing, you know, medical assets. Uh, but but Austin's it's it's heading out i mean it, mm-hmm. it, austin is taking off yeah. and you know it's so you can understand there you know it's like san antonio for austin is kind of an afterthought at this point yeah and you know the thing is that that there's you know obviously austin would love to have you know uh, major league sports uh, uh you know one of the one of the major uh, franchise and one of the major uh, professional sports uh san antonio would like to have more than just nba basketball but it would seem to me that that the 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 best course would be for for there to be some cooperation and and maybe try to pitch something be, maybe between the two cities. So it wouldn't really be like a San Antonio thing or an Austin thing, but maybe you know it's more of like a, a, a regional Texas thing. Yeah, I mean, like like Fort Worth and Dallas. You know, they've right. got they've got Arlington. Hey, exactly. guess what? You've got a huge stadium in Arlington. Right. There you go. <laughs> I mean, it's a little you know, it's thirty about thirty miles between Fort Worth and Houston, or uh, pardon me, Dallas. And seventy between San Antonio and Austin, so you're talking about a little more space. But yeah, I mean, you're you're right, absolutely. Well, I think we're going to wrap things up on that note. Uh, thank you all for listening. Hope everybody's doing well, and we'll be back with you next week. Take care. Bye.